Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Renee Yager, the Director of Marketing at EPC, and welcome to today's webinar, Using Test to Fail Methodology to Accurately Predict Projected Lifetime of GAN FETs and ICs in Common DC-DC Converter Topologies. This is the second of our four-part summer series, which is running bi-weekly through the end of August and focusing on GAN reliability in real-world applications. If you missed the first installment, which was focused on solar applications, the replay is available on the website at epc-co.com. Uh, remember that you can earn reward points for registering, attending, and engaging, and be entered in a raffle to win a $2,500 Amazon gift card. The details of the awards program are also available on the website. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. You do have the opportunity to submit text questions to the panel by typing your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. You can send your questions in at any time. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Shenke Zhang is Vice President of Product Reliability at EPC, where he leads the conduction of failure analysis for all GAN transistors and ICs. Prior to joining EPC, he worked as Senior Failure Analysis Engineer on RF MEMS devices in the mobile industry. He earned his PhD degree in Material Science and Engineering from Arizona State University, investigating low-loss dielectrics for cellular and advanced computing applications. He is the author and co-author of more than 20 technical papers, a committee member and our internal liaison for JEDEX JC70 Wideband Gap Power Electronic Conversion Semiconductor Committee. Shanke, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you. Um, so let's get started. Uh, today, we will discuss using test to fail methodology to accurately predict projected lifetime of EGAN devices in common DC DC converter topology. Um, why test to fail? Standard qualification typically produce zero failure out of a large group of parts tested. Therefore, it's quite challenging to apply the test results to a specific application that has a unique mission profile. That is why we need test to fail and follow with failure analysis to understand the underlying failure mechanisms. Here is a list of stressors and the corresponding intrinsic wear out mechanisms. The detailed methodology and the result uh, were published in this peer review book, the GAN power devices and the application. So uh, here is a 48 volt to 12 volt bug converter developed by EPC featuring EPC 2218, uh, a 100 volt rated EGAN transistor. As you can see in the efficiency plot on the right, 100 volt rated EGAN devices offer superior efficiency at 96.5% with 48 volt input and 12 volt output at 50 kilohertz. So here shows a 48 volt, one kilowatt LLC resonant converter developed by EPC, also featuring EPC 2218, 100 volt part on the primary side and 40 volt EPC 2024 devices on the secondary side. Low voltage EGAN devices offer 97.5% uh, of peak efficiency at 400 watt. For DC-DC converters, we identified three main stressors, which are gate bias, drain bias, and temperature cycling, TC. Uh, all three stressors are critical and affect the total lifetime. So the question is, how can we quantify the impact of each stressor towards, towards the total lifetime? We developed this equation to quantify the influence of each stressor. Basically, the harshest stressor or the one that gives give you the least lifetime dominates the overall lifetime. So next, we will examine each stressor individually. Gate bias. To start off, let's look at our gate structure in this TEM cross-section image, where we can see the source metal, gate metal, source field plate, and the gate. You may notice a dark layer between the source metal field plate and the gate. This is a silicon nitride dielectric layer. Please keep this cross-section in mind because we will come back to this image 
when discussing gate failure mechanism. We conducted accelerated gate reliability testing where we took our devices well beyond the data sheet limit and monitor how they fail. Here's the viable distribution plot of the test results where the vertical axis is the failure rate and the horizontal axis shows the time of failure in unit of seconds. We took four group of parts, 32 devices each group and tested them at eight volt, 8.5 volt, nine volt and 9.5 volt respectively. As you can see in the viable, the devices fail very quickly at 9.5 volt but it, it took hundreds of hours to generate just two failures at A volt. After failures were identified, we conducted failure analysis. Now let's take a look at our, uh, take a look at our FA results. So here's the cross section of the failure site where you can see the failure occurred between the gig metal and the metal one fuel plate as shown in this circle. In fact, all the devices failed in a similar manner, sometime on the left, sometime on the right. So based on the FA result, a good understanding of the intrinsic wear out mechanism was found. So next, we would like to use a physics-based model to explain this failure mechanism. So we are going to use uh, impact ionization process to explain the failure process. In the first step, Electrons are injected into the PGAN gate layer from the two that over the aluminum gallium nitride barrier layer, as you can see that right here. In the second step, where electrons enter the PGAN gate and they are accelerated rapidly by the electric, electric field, we sun gaining sufficient energy to cause impact ionization and generate holes. In the final step, Holes are trying to move away from the gate corner under the influence of the electric field and become trapped in the silicon uh, nitride dielectric layer, leading to a growing positive char trapped, uh, char uh, trap charges, QH. Once this uh, charge density reaches a critical density, the dielectric ruptures, causing the catastrophic failure uh, mode at the gate corner as observed in failure analysis. So this slide shows how we model this uh, impact ionization process. We follow peer review publications summarized in this table by, combine, by combining various equations. We yielded our final expression for the mean time to fail responsible for the gate failure. Now let's take a look how well the, this model explains the experimental data. Uh, the impact ionization model is plotted against the measured data points for EPC 2212, where a good fit is found. If we keep the gate bias at six volt, the VDS max, we project less than one PPM failure rate over 35 years of lifetime under continuous DC bias. This projection is also consistent with our field experience. Next, drain bias. To start off, we also must took a, take a look at the cross section again, where we can see drain contact, fuel plate, gate, and source contact shown in the image. First, we would like to examine the physics that of RDS on shift. So when devices are subjected to high drain bias, we observed a lot of hotspots using EMI, a common failure analysis technique. Those hotspots, hotspots suggest that uh, electrons were accelerated by the high electric field and become hot carriers. If we zoom in the hotspot image and overlay it with the mask layout, we found, we, we, we found that uh, the, hotspot, uh, the, the hotspot predominantly occurred at the edge of the drain contact as shown in this picture, indicating that where hot, where electrons got, where that is exactly where the electrons got trapped and therefore responsible for the dynamic RDS on shift. By using, by using this imaging tool, we designed our generation five and the generation six devices that are much less 
susceptible to hot carry injection induced dynamic artisan shift. Based on all the findings discussed, we develop a physics-based model to explain this hot carry trapping process. So electrons in the two deck are uh, accelerated by the high electric field and then scattered by the lattice and become trapped in the passive, passive vision film by the drain contact where the hot, those hot spots were seen. Now we align band structure near the drain contact where we can uh, find, where, where we can see uh, energy barrier that exists for the electron to overcome. The majority of electrons do not have sufficient kinetic energy to get over the barrier. On, only a very small fraction of electrons uh, does. Then subsequently get trapped within the silicon nitrate dielectric layer. As more and more electrons are trapped, the barrier height is further enhanced by the electrostatic uh, field resulting from the trap charges, as indicated by this uh, arrow. This dynamic barrier height change is uh, essentially the key for the lifetime model development. Here are the equations you, we used to model this hot carrier trapping process. By combining everything together, it yielded this final dynamic RDS equation that includes voltage, temperature, and time. Now let's take a look how well the model fit, fits the experimental data. Here shows a comparison of measurement and the model for EPC 2045 100 volt gen generation five devices operated at four different voltages and three different temperatures. Good agreements between measurements and the model were found, which demonstrate the validity, validity of the model. So after we have um, a model, now let's apply the model we developed to project lifetime for a buck converter as an example. Here is a common uh, 48 volt to 12 volt buck converter operating in continuous conduction mode. All param parasitic inductance were added in the schematics. Now we introduce a 200 picofarad L5 parasitic inductance to simulate a worst case scenario in application. So in SPICE modeling, we observe a peak voltage ring of 120 volt approximately with bus voltage at 80 volt during turnoff. So this waveform basically is potentially the worst case scenario in real world application. Now let's examine how our, uh, using a reliability test to fail approach, how will we do in this under distress conditions? So here shows the turn off voltage waveform again of the buck converter showing previously, where you probably noticed the key stressor is the over voltage ring. Let's first focus the first three rings with the highest amplitude, uh, which I believe to have the most impact on gain reliability. Here's the zooming image of the first three ring. So we, we found that the over voltage ring can be deconvoluted by its by individual sinusoidal shape voltage spikes as showing the red curve right here. Okay, so now the next step to emulate the over voltage ring effect. So we developed this unclamped inductive switching test circuit as showing this schematics recently, where we can, we can also conduct in situ RDS monitoring to monitor how well uh, the how or how the RDS uh, change over time under this 120 volt repetitive over voltage spikes. On the right is the resulting 120 volt peak over voltage waveform that is produced by this unclamped inductive switching circuit. Therefore, the deconvoluted over voltage ring can be simulated by this UIS test circuit. So now let's examine how well our GAN FETs uh, performed on the repetitive 120 volt over voltage testing. Okay. 
So here's the test results. We tested three representative EPC 2218, 100 volt weighted gain fats from three different lots and wafers to uh, 1.5 billion of 120 volts over voltage spikes, where very minimum RD shift was observed. When we project the shift uh, to 25 years using the lifetime model, we developed using the, the top Gary trapping effect. We observed that all the data points uh, collected by the UIN, the unclamped inductive switching circuit, fall on exactly on the projected uh, line. And the projected shift for 25 years is less than 10%. Now let's test our latest PQFM device, BC2302. So we showed one representative EPC2302 device, uh, also 100 volt rated to a whopping 10 billion cycles of 120 volt over voltage spikes, where very small RDS on shift were measured. So as you can see, the additional 8.5 billion switching cycles still follow the linear projected line, which provides further validation to our hot carrier trapping lifetime model developed. It also shows that uh, very small artisan shift over 25 years of continuous operation under repetitive over voltage switching. So the collective results uh, uh, demonstrate the extreme robustness of our 100 volt Again, fats on the 120 volt over voltage repetitive switching. Okay, so next, as you can see that uh, in, let's come back to this uh, turn off uh, voltage waveform from the buck converter, where you notice that there's another critical component of this, uh, of this uh, voltage waveform come from the 80 volt bus voltage. So, and so that therefore we can also deconvolute, deconvolute this 80 volt bus voltage by using a resistive load hard switching circuit to emulate the stress condition. Here shows the, the turn off voltage, drain voltage waveform we, uh, re, uh, collected by our resistive load hard switching circuit and overlay it with the bus converter turn off waveform. So here is the resistive load um, testing circuit. Here shows the schematics we developed to model the hard switching turn off characteristic, where we can monitor, where we can also monitor the evolution RDSO, RDSO in situ at 100 kilohertz. So the drain uh, voltage turn off waveform is showing on the right. So here, we, we tested another representative of EPC2218 and EPC2302, both 100 volt rated transit, uh, EGAN transistors. One 2218 is the chipsicle package part. EPC2302 is a package, uh, QFM package devices. So both devices, we found less than 10% RDS on shift over 25 years of continuous operation at 80 volt and 100 kilohertz. This also demonstrate the, the robustness of our 100 volt EGAN fat under 80 volt uh, off state bias. So next and lastly is the temperature cycling PC. Uh, board, level te uh, board level temperature cycling testing of EPC 2218 was done at two different conditions, which are minus 40 C to 125 C and minus 40C to 105C. At TC1 condition, we tested two groups of parts with and without underfill devices, uh, without underfill material. We generated another viable plot for three sets of temperature cycling data using our test to fill approach. Most importantly, underfill drastically improved the temperature cycling reliability of our uh, gypsum package devices as you can see on the right the black curve on the right, we have yet identified any failure to date at 3000 cycles of minus 40, minus 40 Celsius to 125 Celsius testing. 
based on this uh, test to fail uh, on the viable data, now we are able to develop a general temperature cycling lifetime model as shown here, which is known as the uh, noise Landsberg model. So N on the left is number of cycles to failure. A is a coefficient. The first term is a frequency term, which includes how many cycles per day during this temperature cycling testing. The second term is the delta T term, which is the classic coffin mensing equation. This term, uh, this term focuses on the solid joint fatigue uh, wear out mechanism. Lastly, is the Arrhenius term, which is primarily to model solder creep wear out mechanism, because solder typically fails faster when the hot extreme, extreme temperature is higher, which is T max is higher. So here are the parameters for the lifetime model of EPC 2218 using SAC-305 solid material. Okay, the next question, how, so we have this uh, lifetime model, how do we use it? And then how can we apply the model to project lifetime in real world application? So let's first start with this noise Landsberg, uh, Landsberg equation, uh, TC lifetime model again. First, let's assume the T max is 125C, possibly the worst case scenario in application. So therefore the Arrhenius term essentially is a constant, uh, a coefficient. We can lump it into a coefficient. Now we can plot the N on left side of the equation cycle to failure as a function of delta t at 100 ppm or 0.01 percent failure rate uh, we collected from the test to fail viable plot okay so let's take a look here's the result so by assuming the t max 125c we are plotting the basically the classic coffin mensing equation and as a function of delta t at 100 ppm failure rate. Now let's look at and let's uh, come back to this uh, 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 the lifetime the temperature cycling lifetime equation again. Now well, let's assume T max is only 100 C, which is less than the previous case. So based on the understanding of the underlying failure mechanism, we ought to have slightly longer lifetime, right? So now let's plot n as a function delta t again by assuming t max is 100 Celsius, 25 degrees less than the previous slide at 100 ppm, 0.01% failure rate. Here's the result where we see slightly improved uh, lifetime compared to t max of 125C. Now let's take a look. Uh, we add t max of 75C and T max of 50 Celsius. And then we plot them on the same plot as showing on the right. So as you can see, makes sense. As T max decreases, we got more and more lifetime. So now the question is how to read this plot if the engineer who, are, who is playing a DC-DC converter. So how can we use this plot? So now I'm going to give you an example to show you how to use this, uh, I'll say empirical equation generated plot. Uh, first, let's assume now it's a, basically now it's a summer in Phoenix, Arizona, where the ambient temperature outside is gonna say is probably roughly, uh, in the worst case is uh, 50 Celsius, which is in the folks in the US is about 122 Fahrenheit. So now, so, so in the in outside, there's an application where the DC DC converter generates another 50 Celsius of resulting from self heating. That's another 50 degrees Celsius. So now, by combining them together, our T max is 100 C. The delta T is 50 C. Okay. Now let's come back to the plot on the right, where we can follow the orange curve, where T max is 100 Celsius. And then let's read from the horizontal axis with delta T of 50 Celsius, which is right here. Now we can read on the vertical axis, which is a uh, cycle to failure, about 20,000 cycles with, uh, with 
100 ppm failure rate. So this just gives you an example how to use our uh, reliability testing result, test you fail, to come to, uh, to walk you through to a real world uh, application lifetime uh, estimation. Okay, so conclusions. Based, so we have discussed gate, drain, and temperature cycling, three reliability stressors. On gate reliability, gate should have very low failure rate when we keep the gate bias at and below the max rated gate voltage per data sheet. On the all on the uh, on clamp inductive switching testing result, we show that GAN devices have extreme robustness under 120 volt drain over voltage spikes. We tested up to 10 billion switching cycles on our 100 volt EGAN devices. Uh, next, using our resistive volt hard switching circuit, we, uh, we found that GAN devices are projected to have less than 10% shift over 25 years of continuous operation at 80 volt bus voltage and 100 kilohertz. Next, in our temperature cycling section, we showed that underfilled chip scale package GAN devices showed excellent temperature cycling reliability. And so based on the light test to fail lifetime equation, we developed uh, a methodology to estimate a TC lifetime in a real world application. These temperature cycling models can also be adapted to various die size and configurations. So that concludes today's uh, webinar. Thank you. So any questions? Lost my mute button. OK. <laughs> so now we will start answering the questions that came in uh, during the presentation. You can still continue to put questions into the Q&A box, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so first we have on page 10, was the failure always on the left side? Uh, no. So we actually conducted a lot of, uh, we conducted failure analysis on a lot of failures. So as mentioned in the slides, so sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right, but it's always on the corner. That's one of the critical findings when we're developing the lifetime model. Okay. Also on page 10 is the silicon nitride material properties consistent among wafers. Yeah, yes. So we actually have uh, a PCM or the a lot of test structures on the wafer. We test regularly. They don't, they have very good quality. So we test them to fail the, the test structures. They are reaching the entry, the, the, the breakdown voltage reported by the literature. So basically they shouldn't break until uh, hundred volt. Okay. On slide 15, what tool did you use to simulate the hotspots? It's a Emmy. It's a, we call it's basically using a, it's a wave, uh, it's a, it's hot care. It's a basically it's a electron. Hole. So it is a electron emission, which is a very class, a uh, very standard field analysis tool. So the detector we are using, I think it's an in-gas detect detector. And um, I think, yeah, that's what we used. Okay. Can your model be applied to other material systems? Well, can you say, uh, which, uh, which material system? Can, can you repeat that question? Um, so I, can your model apply to other material systems? Other material systems. Which model? Uh, I'm not quite sure. There's the three models we developed, discussed. Okay, so if you ask that question, could you just send in a, a clarification, and we'll we'll come back. We'll circle back around to it. Okay. Okay. Um, which current sensor is suitable for GAN-based synchronous buck converters, and why? I think that's probably Andrea's question. Andrea. Yes, I'm sorry, help? I forgot to introduce Andrea. Yeah. And Andrea Gorgerino is also on the panel. He is uh, head of our FAE team. So. Go ahead, sure. Yeah, I mean, this is a very generic question. I think uh, um, there, there are no inherent limitations. You know, the top, it's a, more of a topology driven choice. There are things to be careful, of course. Uh, and one of them being the fact that um, your switch nodes 
usually have higher DVD-Ts than a silicon MOSFET equivalent uh, design. And so depending on the current sensor you choose, that might be a limitation in the, in the circuit to implement it. Um, also, if you're using shunts, especially if you put them in series with the FETs, there needs to be some care in making sure they don't couple through the gate driver. So those are some of the limitations in the implementation of some uh, current sensors. But in general, it's a topology-driven topic. Okay. I think this is probably another application question. Can GAN devices run directly from controller through isolations without using gate driver? Again, it's not really a specific GAN topic. If your controller can uh, provide the correct voltages and the correct occurrence to do it, uh, the answer is yes. Also, it's topology driven. So we have examples, for example, uh, where we do drive our FETs without a specific gate driver directly from a controller. We usually do that on the very, very small FETs. These are really, really tiny FETs. Uh, the advantage of GAN is, is that the gate charge is very small. So that reduces the requirement in terms of current versus silicon MOSFET. Um, but for example, we do that on some topology which are low side only, so they don't require isolation or level shifting of the signals. That's where our gate driver pretty much becomes uh, uh, required. But but yeah, I think basically the gate charge is very small. So if you have a topology that's compatible and you have a good enough controller, yes. And we do that in some of our references and for wireless, wireless power, for example. Um, on slide 26, is the clipped circuit integrated to the EPC FET driver? No, no, it's external. So we discussed that. No, it's not. Okay. Do you have results of dynamic RDS on over longer times, for example, 4,000 hours? Uh, we don't have 4,000 hours, but we do have 1,000 hours data that is documented in our phase real report. So basically, they still follow the same trajectory based on... Um, model, the uh, fit by our model. Okay. On slide 30, can the equation be used for pulse operation? Pulse operation, PC. So I, uh, I think, I think so. Embedding pulse operation is essentially the self-heating. We call it the IOL, uh, this is by self-heating. I think so. Okay. You talked about positive ultra over voltage. What about negative over voltage, such as when gate voltage goes below negative three volts due to ringing? Uh, we have conducted a lot of uh, testing on the negative gate voltage. So the, the answer is there, the, our GAN device is now going to fail catastrophically under the top of minus 10 volts because there are, we, we actually did all the work and the study uh, on that, uh, on the so gate negative over voltage. So, from the reliability point of view, so uh, under uh, negative gate voltage, we are actually depleting the two that. So we don't we see no hotspot, and also uh, we we conduct a lot of reliability testing. Basically, we I don't see failure at the, the negative fifteen volt, but there's might be some slight uh, parametric shift when you subject the part to that uh, extreme uh, negative uh, gate bias. But uh, if you say minus three volt, I don't see any issue, both from a physics point of view and also from reliability uh, testing point of the data point of view, yeah. Okay. Is Tmax the junction temperature or a case temperature? Uh, so I think it's the... Uh, it depends. So, okay, if we just talk about temperature cycling, which is resulting from the ambient, that's the ambient temperature. So, because under that, so essentially it's the case and the, the, the junction, uh, because there's no electrical bias. But if you talk about the, say, uh, power switching cycles, I think that essentially is the junction temperature. What is the electrical signature for the gate corner dielectric charging? Is there a change in device BT or other characteristics? Uh, so say this guy, after the fact, we caused this failure. 
So what we can observe, uh, we have done a lot of data analysis, uh, both electrically and physically. So what you will see essentially is a gate to source short. However, the underlying uh, we call channel is mostly intact. So a lot of times, essentially, we are looking at uh, a drain. So it's a, it's a, you are tied the gate and sort together. And so drain is not really compromised. You are essentially looking at a diode uh, configuration. Uh, so that kind of the electri electrical signature uh, post this uh, failure mode. Okay. Uh, what type of underfill for the GAN devices have you used? So uh, historically, we have used Namics and uh, Henkel underfills, which uh, the, where the data shows we have, they have very comparable uh, temperature cycling reliability. So we actually run a lot of uh, both experiment and uh, uh, finite element analysis. So and generated some guidelines that is documented in our phase real report. Um, yeah. Uh, what about pulse drain current? From the data sheet, the pulse drain current rating is lower than that of an equivalent MOSFET. Andrea, can you just say, do you, do you have any thoughts on this question? Because I'm not quite sure. Um, I have, I think it depends really how you do the comparison. I little bit surprised about this but anyway the pulse drain current is a measurement of the saturation of the device um so I, it depends what you compare apples to apples um i think it's very equivalent and the mechanism is very similar um so uh, yeah i think it depends which device you really uh, compare but on the pulse rating is basically just saturation of the device i don't, I don't think that's very different honestly Typically, again, should be more intrinsically is more robust in terms because it can with, uh, withstand more heat and temp uh, higher temperature. So I'm a little surprised. So that's, not, that's something that's something we need to look into more. Okay. Um, can the MTTF, MTTF model be applied to other materials like gallium arsenide, for example? I think that reliability, uh, the general uh, guideline of equations, I think the answer is yes. But the specific failure mode and mechanism probably is uh, pretty unique to GAN. But the, the methodology and the MTTF equation that should apply to all the devices. What kind of considerations should we take while paralleling EPC GAN devices? Probably that's an Andrea question. That's a, that's a I mean, uh, very quick, we do have some app notes that talk about it. Again, uh, in general, there are, um, I, I would say when you parallel devices, there are uh, current sharing is basically what you are interested in. Current sharing can happen in uh, continuous mode. So when both devices are on, but it can also happen when they are switching. And so you have to care about different considerations. So in the steady state mode, um, it, I think it's really about the RDS on, similar to a silicon MOSFET. We both, both of these devices have a positive temperature coefficient. So that leads to a balancing out of the currents in, when they're both on. And during the transient, um, I think GAN behaves a little bit better than a silicon MOSFET, the threshold. Uh, is almost flat while the threshold is a negative temperature coefficient, which leads to unbalance during uh, transients. Um, and during transient, what really matters uh, beyond the device itself is the PCB layout. And so balancing all the layouts and all the parasitics, that's where we have some guidelines, especially with GAN devices, if you're going to switch fast, uh, even small unbalances can lead to uh, very bad current sharing during switching events. So um, yeah, you have to be careful. But the layouts, we are, we basically, for high switching speeds, we propose a layout where you parallel the half bridges uh, instead of the actual devices. Uh, we have examples of layout. But again, there's an app note describing that as well as a couple of reference design that implement that uh, that parallel and cost them to keep the 
the paths as uh, uh, symmetrical as possible. And uh, the other thing that really uh, is recommended is use individual gate resistors to avoid ringing between uh, the two gates. Um, and yeah, I think those are the main things for paralleling, but they parallel very well. Uh, what is the gate delta voltage between the most optimum switching performance and the voltage where M mean time between failure starts decreasing? Start we decreasing. recommend five volts five volts. operation. Yeah. Five, 5 5.2 volts. Okay. Is there any benefit of using a negative output gate drive DC? -DC? No. Okay. No, there isn't. Uh, you basically, but the implementation of negative gate drive is required when you want to avoid basically self turn on Miller shoot through type of situations. Um, we are able to avoid that thanks to basically the charge ratios between CGD and, and uh, CGS. Um, there's a, on our website, there's some more details, but basically we, our charge ratio is, is always below one. So it basically it's very immune to self turn on. Um, and also the reason you want to avoid using negative turn on is because during the dead time, um, the reverse conduction voltage drop is actually, uh, although it looks like a diode, it's a slightly different mechanism. And so the voltage drop is higher. And if you use negative drive, it becomes that negative voltage gets added to that voltage drop during the dead time, which will add to dead time losses. So basically it's not needed to avoid the shoot through and it's uh, uh, detrimental in terms of losses. So we, we, all of our designs and all of our reference designs always implement zero volt to turn on, which also makes a turn off, which also makes the gate driver easier. Are there accelerated combined of combined effects when both gate and drain are stressed together, or does the simple addition of MTTF, as you showed in the beginning, agree with experimental data? Oh, uh, yeah, the, uh, I think this is, a, okay, let me first explain. So how we come up with this equation. So this, uh, I listed the literature that uh, how we come to this equation, essentially based on the fit rate. So when you have different failure mechanism, the total fit rate is the sum, it's a simple summation of all the ones that are included. So because fit rate is, is, is proportional to one over mean time to fail. So that's how we develop this equation um, based on literature. Um, so if we take the mean time to fail, and to, together, so what we have learned is that the gate is not really a problem. So it's very, so basically from the denominator point of view, I think probably so far we are looking at drain. I don't think in, in the intrinsic wear out, from the intrinsic wear out, wear out mechanism point of view. First, there's no catastrophic failure, even to 120 volt over voltage switching. And then I don't see there's a, uh, there's anything, uh, there's the mean time to fail is very little, basically. Uh, so that leaves us to the last term, which is temperature cycling. So if, so if we want to say for our chipsicle package part, I think probably temperature cycling, depending on mission profile, that could be a limiting factor, but by adding other film material, that should solve the problem. So this is showing approach, how we tr try to address the reliability issues. So when we see something that is, uh, uh, we have a, a very significant denominator, which is temperature cycling in the beginning, that's why we address it by using underfill material. So, so far, I think the, the total, uh, the mean time to fill or the fit rate over in the field is consistent with this, uh, uh, the, with what we have uh, studied based on the, our rapid testing results, which is very low. What will be the effect on dead time if we consider it for a synchronous buck converter as compared to IGBT or MOSFET? Well, the I mean the effect of dead time is that uh, on a on a GAN device is if you you know at the end of dead time is required because of rise and fall time, so those are much smaller in a GAN fed than a silicon MOSFET or an even IGBT even more. Also, there's no reverse recovery, so. At the end of the day, in your application, regardless of the topology, you can operate with very short dead times. We typically operate our FETs in our reference designs below 20 nanoseconds dead time. You know, in, in a 
regular buck converter, maybe it's not a huge impact. Um, in some corner cases, it can be because basically you have more volt seconds available or basically you can operate in some more extreme duty cycle uh, uh, operation corners, which might be beneficial depending on your particular application. Uh, in other application, it's even more beneficial, like in motor drives, it reduces a lot of the distortions or modulations. Um, so it, it, basically the effect of the dead time is topology specific, application specific, the advantage of GAN it is it can operate with extremely low dead times. Um, how can the test to fail approach effectively account for various stressors and interactions between device components, such as parasitics, thermal effects, and electrical overstress? Yeah, this is exactly what we discussed today, right? So, uh, so, so that's, uh, say, just one example. We have the over voltage stress. I think that's the last thing mentioned. That's which uh, we can deconvolute uh, by use by looking at this uh, turn on waveform in application. That's how we address the. So basically, we use the piecewise approach. We deconvolute each stressors to a standalone that can be modeled and studied in the rivalry lab. Then we design a representative circuit and topology to emulate the stressor. And let's just use the over voltage as an example. So this is how we do it. And then we test it repetitively. We test different wafers, different parts, different uh, at a different time, 1.5 billion, and then to 10 billion switching cycles. Essentially, the goal is to by understand the underlying failure mechanism. So we, we don't have to test, say, 4,000 4, hours. We just need to test, say, two hours. So and then everything else agrees. So basically we test for two hours now, we can project what's going to happen at 25 years by understanding the underlying failure mechanism. That's why we spend so much effort in failure analysis and the model development. To, and then all the data we are taking can, they are, are falling exactly on the projected line. And then we show the validity of our model. That's kind of the approach we are, uh, that, that, that's the exact approach we are taking to address the reliability concern. So what was that, I think, am I ask, answering that question? Um, um, so you mentioned gen five and six improvements in the drain stress fail reduction. Is there a die size cost for this? No, we actually, we are, so what we are doing is that uh, we actually just take this cross section image so well, we, the answer is no. So we actually improve the die size or reduce the die size by shortening the distance between drain and gate in our Gen 5 and Gen 6. Gen 6 is further 20% reduction in, uh, in terms of die size, which gives you the same performance. So, but the, one of the critical concerns is dynamic RDS on. But we have this approach, and then also with some TGAS simulation, we can effectively modulate the electric field so that uh, so that to mitigate the the RDS on shift effect. So and so with the combination of understanding the physics mechanism, and we have a very surgical and a sensitive tool to image, and then we have that can be validated by our simulation and then our DOE experiment. So that's kind of the approach that uh, we are taking to develop our generation five and generation six. The short answer is no. So we actually shrink more in general generation five weeks. So basically, basically we're getting better performance devices with uh, less die size. Okay. Have you compared the test to failure for GAN on silicon versus GAN on GAN, GAN on silicon carbide? No. Do you recommend the use of additional overcurrent protection when using your ICs? That is application specific. Our IC don't have overcurrent built in. So if your application requires some sort of overcurrent protection, then you will have to implement it separately. Yes. Okay. All right, great. So I think we got to most um, everybody. So I just wanted to say thank you, Shanky. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to everybody for attending today.
Uh, if you do have any additional questions, you can send them into info at epc-co.com and we'll get them answered for you. You should get an email in the, the next 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, as well as a copy of the presentation. Uh, lastly, be sure to register and attend the remaining installments of the Summer of GAN webinar series. Uh, the next one will be in a, another two weeks on August 9th. We'll be talking about reliability in space applications. You can visit us at epc-co.com for more information and to register. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.